submarines, massive machines that operate in the most hostile conditions on the planet. A world with no light, no air, and crushing pressures. Inner space. But there's one massive advantage to being underwater that has driven the development of submarines. And that is you can hide something this big anywhere in the world and no one can find you. The underwater world, an amazing place to be if you don't want to be seen. And a couple of hundred years ago, people realized there might be a military use for the concealing powers of water. In 1776, American revolutionary David Bushnell came up with a devious plan to defeat the British. Crazy as it seems, Bushnell's idea was to sneak up on the British flagship in New York Harbor, concealed underwater, and blow it up in an oversized wooden barrel. And this is a replica of the machine he came up with. But it's not just any old barrel. Bushnell's turtle was man-powered and submersible. It was the first submarine. And for its day, it was an incredibly advanced machine. It had controls to go every which way. It even had a depth gauge. And Bushnell was also smart enough to persuade someone else to drive it. A young soldier called Ezra Lee. Ezra had a rudder to steer and used foot pedals to drive a propeller, <laughs> allowing him to move towards his target at a sedate two knots. Just before dawn, he submerged and pedaled his barrel right under the flagship. And then the main business. On the back of the turtle was a wooden bomb containing 70 kilograms of gunpowder attached by a rope to a screw on top of the turtle which Ezra planned to attach to the ship's hull using another crank. But, unfortunately, he managed to position the turtle underneath an impenetrable part of the hull and couldn't get the screw to bite. Exhausted and running out of air, he surfaced, was spotted by the British and only narrowly escaped. Although a failure, the turtle had demonstrated the sneaky, stealthy potential for submarine warfare. He must have been fit. It also demonstrated that a submarine on the surface is also the proverbial sitting duck. Sad but true, I'm afraid, Daffy. <sighs> to become a more lethal weapon, the submarine would need to stay hidden underwater for much longer. But the turtle did establish the basic principles used by all subsequent submarines. This two-man mini-sub is its direct descendant. But thanks to batteries and life support systems, this sub can stay submerged for up to eight hours to search for wrecks or simply poke around this picturesque West Country quarry. She's built to explore the submarine world, not mooch around up here. Come on, dive, dive, dive. Welcome to Inner Space. It's pretty weird down here, and even in a modern sub like this, quite scary. We're landing now on the ground. Oh, it's on silt. I'm suddenly finding I don't like being a submarine here. Thankfully, submarines are as good at going back up as they are at going down. The secret is a brilliantly simple device known as the ballast tank, as used on all submarines. Here's one I made earlier. There we are, our model submarine. Each of the ballast tanks has permanently open holes along the bottom and vents on the top, controlled by me removing these blobs of blue tack. Now to submerge, what I do is I remove the blue tack, air escapes, allowing water to flow into the tanks and the submarine starts to submerge. Once you reach the desired depth, you close the vents, to stop the descent and hover. Now, surfacing is simply a matter of getting air into the tanks. 
and the submarine returns to the surface. Simple. Bushnell's turtle had astonishingly cracked the main principles. But it would be another 125 years before the technology was available to build the first truly practical submarine. And this is it, the Holland One, the Royal Navy's first submarine, launched in 1901 with a crew of seven unwashed sailors, to quote the Admiral of the Fleet. Ironically, it had been designed by Irish émigré John Holland with the destruction of the Royal Navy in mind. The Admiralty saw submarine warfare as underwater, underhand and damned un-English, but bought five of the things all the same. The Holland One rocked along at nearly eight knots on the surface, thanks to this 160 horsepower petrol engine. That's a whole lot of power for a hundred years ago, but it wasn't much use once submerged. If you left your engine running underwater for more than a few seconds, you'd use up all the oxygen in your watertight container, choking your crew in the process, which is pretty bad news. But Holland had come up with a solution. Like the mini-sub, Holland 1 ran on electric power when submerged. And Holland had worked out how to keep his batteries topped up between missions. The clever part is that on the surface, with plenty of oxygen available, the petrol engine not only drove the propeller, but it also rotated the electric motor backwards, turning it into a generator which charged the batteries. And that's the way submarines would be powered for the next 50 years. On a full charge, the Holland One could submerge for nearly four hours. It was also designed to withstand the massive increase in pressure of deep water. To demonstrate, take a simple, non-reinforced cylindrical hull, descend, and water pressure soon starts to deform that hull. Not a good idea. Making your hull much thicker would add too much weight. So Holland employed a very simple device. Reinforcing rings, or as they're known in the trade, frames. They act to strengthen the hull. Without them, it would be crushed like a giant tin can. If we take a similar hull and reinforce with stiffeners, just like in the Holland. There we are, there we have a similar hull with stiffeners and frames. Let's try again. Descend. Ah! We have integrity. Top stiffeners. The Holland could dive to 20 meters, making it pretty stealthy. But its most important innovation was its ability to attack without having to surface. Thanks to this clever little device, enter the periscope. This gave you a great tactical advantage. You could see ships, but ships couldn't see you. Delightfully underhand. And the perfect way to target the submarine's most notorious weapon, the torpedo. Torpedo in the water. 1,000 feet to target. One second to impact. The torpedo allows a submerged submarine to attack from a distance and turn and run before the enemy has a chance to fire back. The perfect weapon for a stealth attack. To fire, you would crank open the torpedo hatch at the front, flooding the tube. Compressed air would then be blasted into the tube, forcing the torpedo out into the water. It would then run under its own compressed air for 300 yards until hopefully it struck home. The Holland One convinced the British Admiralty that submarines were a valuable weapon. But this machine was limited to harbour operations only. The low conning tower put it at real risk from flooding in anything but dead calm conditions. And that's exactly what happened to this submarine. Whilst being towed to a scrappy in 1913, she was swamped and sank in Plymouth Sound, where she lay undisturbed for 70 years. Which is lucky for us, because otherwise, she would have been melted down to make razor blades. From now on, conning towers would become bigger, much bigger. In fact, massive. 
it was time submarines grew up and went to sea. During World War I, the submarine came of age, sinking an incredible 11 million tons of shipping. That's a quarter of all the world's total tonnage. In World War II, the German Navy built nearly 1,200 U-boats, more than 90% of their entire navy, wreaking havoc on Atlantic convoys. To fight long campaigns at sea, these submarines needed more weapons and more men. They had to get much bigger, and they did. As you can probably tell from the 1,400-ton HMS Alliance diesel-electric long-range patrol submarine behind me. Built in 1945 with a range of 10,000 miles and a crew of 68, she was designed for missions that would keep her at sea for weeks. And inside, submarines had got a lot more complicated. What a place to work. There's levers and controls and dials and switches and everything everywhere. What switch? There's millions of them, for goodness sake. Go away. The Alliance would be crammed with 16 torpedoes. Weapon storage had priority over living conditions. And wherever there was a bit of extra space, you'd find bunks. But not enough bunks for everyone. So you would hot bunk meaning that as soon as you jumped out of bed, there was someone else waiting to jump in for his turn. Lovely. Spending most of the time on the surface, you needed some pretty powerful...